Uh, please open your Bibles to 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24. <clears throat> Uh, this is the kind of life he lived, uh, invited to the kind of life Christ lived. He suffered everything that he came into his way, so that you would know that it could be done, and also know how to do it, step by step. He never did one thing wrong, not once did anything amiss. They called him every name in the book, and he said nothing back. He suffered in silence, content to live, content to let God set things right. He used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so that we can get rid of sin, free to live the right way. Uh, in 1972, Pastor John Lohr Jr. graduated from Southern Missionary College, now known as Southern Adventist University, with a bachelor's degree in religion. Two years later, he would graduate from Andrews University with a master's of divinity, divinity degree. He has also received a bachelor's degree in business administration from Southwest Adventist University in 1994. John pastored for 12 years, then he was a youth director for 11 and a half years in the Seventh-day Adventist Conferences of Central California and Southern New England Conference. In 1998, John became an assistant to the president and communications director for the Upper Columbia Conference of Seventh-day Adventist. Two years later, John became the president of the Montana Conference, and in 2010, he became the exe executive vice president for the administration for the North, North Pacific Union Conference. Uh, John is married to Susan, and they have two children. Their daughter, Cindy, is married and lives in Loma Linda, California, and their so son, Rob, lives in Durham, North, Cal North Carolina. John is a grandfather and has two, two grandchildren. The Chehalis Pathfinders are proud to introduce you are our speaker today, John Lohr, Jr. Well, thank you, Wyatt. I don't know where you got that from. My word. You could have just said, Pastor John Lohr, from Arizona. That's fine, anyway. And, uh, Lydia, congratulations being a Pathfinder officially now. That's awesome. That's very good. It's good to be with you today, and I want to thank the Chehalis Pathfinder Club for giving me the invitation to spend this Sabbath with you. I've just been trying to think uh, how long ago. I'll make sure I get this thing. I'm not used to it. It's been a while since I wore that. All right. I've been thinking... Uh, um, how long it go has been since I've been at a Pathfinder Sabbath. And uh, I'm sitting there and memories are just coming back to me. And the induction service. Man, I can't believe how it's, it can be years, but it's up in there. And that's why, you know, it's good for us to memorize Bible and all and text because they come back to you. They come back to you when, when we need them on that. So it's good to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity. I actually had the privilege of growing up in a Seventh-day Adventist family. My dad was a minister. And I, um, of course, being a minister, my mom was very involved also in church. And she was involved uh, in the youth programming of the church. And this was back, and I won't tell you the years, but I was little before, pre, before Pathfinder age. Because mom was involved with Pathfinders, just as Pathfinders was beginning, um, I was involved in it all the way back then. I remember those early times. Then when I became Lydia's age, then I joined my first Pathfinder club in Dallas, Texas. My dad was pastoring in Dallas, and I joined that club, and, and I had some great experiences. I remember, like today, um, uh, like it was just yesterday, that I was carried the Pathfinder, a big old Pathfinder b banner in, before our church float right downtown in Dallas, Texas. I mean, a big, huge parade. I remember that. It was in Dallas Pathfinder Club that I learned to, um, to do gymnastics. Um, I learned to march. I learned to tie knots. And I had a, it was a small club, but it was a great club. 
And my dad moved to Arlington, uh, Riverside, California area, and pastored the Arlington Church. And that was a big club, like, you know, 60 kids, and 70 you know, kids in a, in a Pathfinder club. I mean, it was really pretty good size. And I really enjoyed that time immensely. Uh, I enjoyed the camping trips, the events, the activities, and those things will live with me forever. And anybody who's been in, in pathfindering will remember first Camp Hale, the first big camperie there in Colorado. These are mile markers in my life. In fact, I love pathfindering so much that when I became a minister, I was hoping that the Lord might call me someday to be a conference youth director. And so I had the privilege of 11 and a half years working as a youth director of two conferences, and part of that responsibility was being a conference Pathfinder director. And because of that, I got acquainted with a lot of local church directors, a lot of local church directors, and I have seen some awesome church Pathfinders, local church Pathfinder directors. And folks, I'm going to tell you right now, in my personal opinion, the toughest job in the church today is being a Pathfinder director. Because it's 24-7. And you talk about plan. And I love you elders, and I love you deacons, and you treasurers, and uh, all the rest. You, you guys have, we couldn't make, church couldn't run without you. But I want to tell you, the people who really put in are the soldiers is those Pathfinder staff, and especially those directors, put them together. And I've met some really wonderful directors. But, in my opinion, I have met the greatest director of all time. And I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 through 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. And I appreciate Wyatt reading that text. He read it. I asked him, uh, I'll ask uh, Pastor Edder to, to have them read it in the Message uh, Bible. Uh, the Message Bible. I'm going to read it now in the New King James Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. The greatest director I have ever met is, you guessed it, Jesus Christ. He's the greatest director. And every single one of us, I believe, should pattern our lives after Jesus. Why? Because he paid the ultimate sacrifice for you, Pathfinders. He paid the, offer, off, the ultimate act, sacrifice for everyone in this church this morning. So I'm very quickly going to hit four points. Boom, 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 real quick. And these are what, my question is, what type of example did Jesus set as the great director for us? So let's get into number one. First example. There are a whole bunch of examples, and we could be here a long, long time looking at the examples that Jesus set for us as Pathfinders and as congregation. But I'm going to only choose four. All right, turn to John chapter 6. The Gospel of John chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. John chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. John chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. What kind of an example did our great director, Jesus Christ, set for you and me? Beginning with verse 37, and these are the Jesus words. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will 
of him who sent me. Jesus came because he wanted to do the will of his heavenly Father. So in other words, the example that he set for us, Pathfinders, is that he trusted in his heavenly Father. He did that in the wilderness. He did that in Gethsemane. He did that as he hung on, as he hung on the cross. He trusted in his heavenly Father. Some time ago, a barn with a lot of horses caught on fire, and the horses were in the barn. And the fire was starting, and the flames were starting to go pretty big time. And the keepers of the horses saw what was happening, and they had to get those horses out of that, farm, out of that barn before it burned down and killed the horses. So what they did, they grabbed the saddle blankets of those horses, and they ran into the barn. They took those saddle blankets threw the saddle blankets around the eyes of the horses and led them out of the barn, past the flames, past the smoke. And those horses were saved. Now, with so much noise, commotion surrounding the horses and the strange smell of smoke clogging their nostrils, one would think that that's the time you would need all your senses, your eyes and everything to get out. But here were humans covering the eyes of the horses with blankets and leading them to safety. Fortunately, in that moment, those horses trusted their keepers. They trusted their keepers. There was no rebelling or challenging their keepers, wisdom or authority. They put their trust in their keepers, and they made it to safety. So Pathfinders, one of the examples that Jesus set for you and me is he trusted in his Heavenly Father. And when we face challenges and things in our lives that we don't understand, and I don't care, you don't have to be an adult to have problems. You Pathfinders, you don't know some things that are going on in your life, and you say, I don't know what to do. We need to put our trust in Jesus, the great director, and he will see us through, even though we don't always understand every detail. Number two, let's turn to John chapter 8, just two chapters away. John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And you know the story. There was a lady who had a problem. She was caught in adultery. And the scribes and Pharisees took her, and they took her to Jesus, and they wanted to put Jesus to a test. Was he going to let them stone her as they were supposed to do? And Jesus didn't say anything. He got down, and he started writing on the ground. And you know what he's writing, don't you remember? What was he writing? Their sins, absolutely. He was writing their sins down. Can't you just picture that? They come and go, oops, oops. And all of a sudden, they started peeling off. And Jesus said, he who is without sin, do what? Cast the first stone. Well, as he finished writing on the ground, he stood up and notice what he said. Verse 10, John 8, verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And I love the next words. I love these words. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The second example that Jesus set for you and me is that he always built people up. He always built people up. He was kind. He was courteous. He was compassionate. Yeah, and some people did some really stupid things, but he didn't sit there and say, well, give them a lecture about it. He built people up. A charming old gentleman 
used to stop occasionally at an antique shop in New Hampshire to sell furniture. And one day, when he left, he was really a nice old gentleman, and he left, the shopkeeper and his wife, uh, husband and wife, they owned this antique shop, his wife said, after, after the little guy left, the older man left, she, she just said, you know, I should have told him how much we enjoy his visits here. And her husband said to her, you know, next time he comes back, because he came back periodically to sell stuff to, the, to them, let's tell him how much we appreciate his visits. Well, some time went by, and he didn't show up. And one day, his daughter came in to the shop. And the owner said, hey, we've missed your dad. We really missed your dad. And she, she said, well, unfortunately, he passed away. He died. And the wife of the, of the shop said, oh, we were going to tell him how much, next time he came, we were going to tell him how much we really appreciated his visits. And tears started forming in the daughter's eyes. She started to cry. And she said, oh, how much good that would have done my father. He was a man who needed to be reassured that he was liked. And that shopkeeper said, the lady said, you know, since that day, whenever I think something particularly nice about a person, I tell them, I might never get another chance. Pathfinders, Jesus never put people down. He didn't call them turkeys or idiots. He said nice things about people. You know, when I see kids, and I'm not even going to say adults, when I see kids and adults tear other people down, you know what that tells me? That tells me they've got a problem with self-worth. Because they have to tear other people down to build themselves up. Jesus always built people up. As pathfinders and his congregation, I hope that we do the same thing. Third example. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 30 through 32. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, third example of Jesus. Since he's my example, he's the great director. Matthew 24, beginning with verse 30. Now, let me give you the background. Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. And they've been dismissed. And Jesus tells the disciples, I want you to get in the boat and go across the Sea of Galilee, and I'll meet you on the other side. So they get in the boat, and Jesus, as the Bible will tell you, he went up in the mountain to pray. By the way, there's something really great about that, spending time with Jesus, spending time with the Lord. Jesus went up to pray. But you know the story. What happened, what happened on the Sea of Galilee when they got out there in the middle of the sea? What, what happened? Tell me. You know the story. What happened? A big storm came, didn't they? And they started panicking out. And then Jesus shows up, but they didn't recognize him at first because it was out there on the water, a bead on the water, and they first thought it was a what? A ghost. So not only were they panicking out about the wind and all of everything that's happening about them and, and the water coming into the boat, they were panicking out, we're seeing a ghost. And then Jesus spoke. He, he spoke. And then you notice, as soon as the Bible says there in verse 27, be of good cheer, Jesus said. It is I, do not be afraid. And as soon as Jesus said that, you remember what Peter did? I want to come out there. Can I come out there with you? I'm trying to figure that out. I'm still trying to figure that whole thing out, why he would do that. But anyway, and Jesus said, come. So he stepped out of the boat. You know the story. 
He was keeping his eyes on Jesus, but when he took his eyes off of Jesus, the great director, what happened to him? He started to sink, didn't he? He started to sink. And where was Jesus? Boom, right there. Reached his hand down and pulled him up. Notice right there, verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, talking about Peter, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and pulled him in the boat. Jesus, third point, Jesus was always very dependable. You could always count on him. Always count on him. I came across something that really, I really enjoyed, and I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to, I'm going to just read it to you here. Because it's really great on dependability. And it's entitled, Did You Ever Notice? And this is how it goes. And you, you just think about yourself. Don't think about your neighbor. Neither you out there, congregation. Just think about yourself. Does one of, do one of these fit you? A lot of Christians are like wheelbarrows. No good unless they are pushed. Some are like canoes. They need to be paddled. Some are like kites. If you don't keep a string on them, they fly away. Some are like footballs. You can't tell which way they will bounce next. Some Christians are like balloons, full of wind and ready to blow up. Some Christians are like trailers. They have to be pulled along. Some Christians are not like neon lights. They keep going off and on, off and on. And then, and then, for which we thank the Lord, some Christians are like good watches, open-faced, pure gold, quietly busy, and full of good works. That's dependability. Jesus was always dependable. Good example for you and me to be dependable at all times, dependable to other people, and most important of all, dependable for our great director, Jesus Christ. Last point, turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 34 and 35, and you, you know this story too. Jesus is someplace else. He's in another town. And he gets word from Martha and Mary that Lazarus is sick. Turning to John, and we're turning to John chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 34 and 35. And Jesus is not there when he gets the message. So he delays his coming a little bit for a purpose, for a purpose. He wanted to show his power as God and as a creator. And Jesus did come. And so when he came to Bethany, talked to Mary and Martha a little bit, and then notice verse 34. John 11, verse 34. You notice what he says. And, G and he, Jesus here, said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, what does it say? That's a, that's a pretty easy memory verse, isn't it? A pretty easy memory verse. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The Desire of Ages says there were several reasons why Jesus wept. But one of those reasons I'm going to read to you from Desire of Ages, page 533. Though he was the Son of God, yet he had taken human nature upon him, and he was moved by human sorrow. His tender, pitying heart is ever awakened to sympathy by suffering. 
He weeps with those that weep and rejoices with those that rejoice. In other words, the example that Jesus set for you and me, Pathfinders and congregation, is that Jesus was sympathetic of people's needs and what they were going through. Too often, we want to give out advice. We're very quick to want to give out advice and straighten somebody out. Correct them when they have a need. But let me tell you a true story. A pastor, a country pastor, went to visit a poor mother on a mountain farm. And when he showed up, tears came to her eyes and she said, oh, pastor, somehow I just felt that you would come today to visit me. I have so many troubles and so many problems uh, that I want you to help me out. So the pastor, he sat down and he started listening to what the lady was saying. She did have a lot of trouble, a lot of problems. In fact, she had such severe problems that it really struck the pastor's heart and the pastor sat there and he's, tears came in his eyes. He's, he actually wept a little bit. And he could, because he knew he, there, there was no way he could solve her problems. I don't know if you've ever been uh, adults out there in a situation where somebody's telling you something and you have no idea what to say. Isn't that? That's the way he felt. But yet, pretty soon, the lady said this, and it kind of surprised him. Pastor, you have settled my problem so nicely. You have given me just the help I needed. He's sitting there shocked because all he did was listen. And then it dawned upon him. It dawned upon him. And he said to himself, Then I knew it was sympathy, not wisdom, which she needed, for not a problem had I solved. Example that Jesus set for us is he showed sympathy to people. Not by correcting them and telling them what they should be doing, but by listening. I hope that we be like that pastor and show sympathy for those who are hurting, if by nothing more than just listening. And when we do that, we're representing that great director. Well, this morning I'm want to just personally say I'm thankful for Jesus Christ, the great director, greatest director that I know and will ever know. I'm thankful for him, and it's my desire that every one of you pathfinders here today and even you in the congregation, parents and maybe guests and visitors, that every single of us, every single one of us, it's my desire that we'll be like Jesus. Is there any amen to that? That we be like Jesus? That we put, when we don't know what's happening around us, we will put our trust in our Heavenly Father. We will put our trust in Jesus. That we will build people up, not tear people down. That we'll be dependable. Dependable. And that we'll be sympathetic. And by that I mean listen to people and love people. And if we do that, and we make Jesus our example, we will not only be excellent witnesses for our great director, but we will be happy parents and happy pathfinders, congregation, all of us will be happy people. May that be the desire of our hearts today. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Loving Father, I want to thank you that you are the great director. I'm so thankful, and we as a congregation are thankful, Lord, for what you've done for us in our own lives. Thank you, Lord, that we can put our trust in you when things are just spinning and we don't know what's, what's going to happen next. Thank you, Lord that we have the opportunity to represent you as a great director by building other people up and not tearing them down. Thank you, Lord, for that we can be dependable, 
for you and that we can be sympathetic. And is my hope and desire with every individual here today, every pathfinder, that in their heart will say, Lord, I want to put my trust in you. I want to build people up. I want to be dependable. And I want to be sympathetic. And Lord, thank you for what you've done for each one of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.